Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to begin this today. When we, we made a conscious decision some time back, years ago, that whenever we celebrated the Lord's Supper together, that we would not just pin it on at the end of the service or rush through it, but that we would reflect and call ourselves back to remembrance of Jesus, knowing that that would challenge uh, the typical sermon length that happens most Sundays. And today I want you to stand with me as we're going to read 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1 to 16. Paul, remember, has said to them in the previous passage, your body is not yours. You were meant, you were made and meant for God. To live a life without committing your life to God by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is to, is to waste your life and miss the very reason you were created. So in this passage, we're going to begin looking at today marriage, immorality, and the gospel. We're going to see Paul says some things, and we've got to understand what he's not saying, but we need to take heart what he is saying. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to have the text on the screen for you to follow along as I read. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote... It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I pray the Lord will teach us how woven through all of this is the importance of the gospel, that which will enable the gospel to advance uh, most freely and unfettered. Thank you. Please be seated. Paul is drawing out further implications from what he taught in the, uh, in the last section concerning our lives. It's very interesting because he, he says in here one, that not only previously, once we confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and become Father,
Christ. Not only, not only are we no longer our own, but we belong to him. We're to glorify God with our lives, our bodies, our minds. But when, we, when in that context, as followers of Jesus Christ, when we get married, we also are no longer our own. If you, if you pick up the tone here, it's about self-denial. In fact, this passage is about self-control and self-denial. I could, I could have entitled it that. Important truths for self-control and self-denial. And so here, he's addressing, and this is, a, this is a difficult thing. If you can read a lot of commentaries on it, because one of the questions in the passage is, uh, is there, are there quotation marks around the first uh, statement that he makes? Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, are there quotation marks around this? It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Because that is critical to understanding the passage. And I happen to believe that, that there are quotation marks around that he was citing something. We looked at that last week, um, by the way, where he was, he was giving back to them some things that were being said in Corinth. Last week we considered that they were twisting something he might have taught them. Curtis Vaughan in his commentary says, in ancient times there was a widespread inclination to regard celibacy as preferable to marriage. It would seem that at least some in the Corinthian church shared this view and argued that it was morally wrong for Christians to marry. In the passage before us, Paul appears to be addressing this attitude. And then Vaughan observes, at least two questions seem to underlie the discussion. One, is it permissible for Christians to marry? Two, are married couples to continue normal sexual relations after becoming Christians? Remember Corinth in Paul's day was a very promiscuous city. You could understand how some who had grown up in Corinth in a very immoral lifestyle, even under the, under the guise of being devoted to the pagan religious worship of the day, would have a uh, knee-jerk reaction, a, a pendulum swing away from wanton, unbridled sexual engagement and passion to abstinence and celibacy. You can see that. It's important to understand this because Paul has, Paul has taken a pretty bad rap from people. Uh, well, why was Paul so down on marriage? Well, he's not down on marriage. If you read the text honestly, what he is, what he is down on is any situation which hinders you in your practice and proclamation of the gospel. Because that's what it's all about for him, to me, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And he wants everyone who's had the imprint of his ministry upon them to embrace that mentality. So what I want us to see, we're going to begin seeing today in this passage, there's five considerations here. First of all, marriage is not mandatory, but it is the normative standard because our Creator God said it is not good for the man to be alone. That is, that's the normal pattern. Two, marriage involves physical obligations binding on both husbands and wives. Three, marriage and the gift of celibacy contrasting the two. Four, is divorce between believers permissible? Five, is divorce between a believer and an unbeliever permissible? We will probably not, we will probably only get through the second point, perhaps into the third point today. First of all, marriage is not mandatory, but it is the normative standard. Look what he says. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. He's been giving it back to them. That's what they're saying. 
I believe is what's going on here. Take, Paul's taken it, this is about which you wrote, he's taken that out of a letter that has come to him from the church at Corinth. He goes on and says, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. He's going to say in this text that he wishes they all could be like him. And that's a whole nother package to unpack. If, if Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee, then the standard for Pharisees was not only that you memorize the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament, but that you be a, you be a married man with a male child. There were several things that they built in. So unless, unless Saul of Tarsus was the exception to those relational standards, somewhere in his past was a wife and a child. And you can read a lot of uh, conjecture about this from, from folks that, that study these things carefully. Some have even suggested that that was his thorn in the flesh. Uh, perhaps when he turned to Christ and away from Judaism that his family had for him what was typical in that day. And they had, they had a funeral where they, where they relationally buried him. He was no longer alive in the sight of his parents, of his kinsmen, of even a wife and a child. He had such. But he acknowledges here something very significant, I think, when he says, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, which would, again, not be surprising in a town like Corinth. Where it was, uh, it was. If you read accounts of Corinth, it, it, it's just horrible. But as I said last week, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Corinth would blush at modern-day America, and we've forgotten how to blush. And so we need this word today. We need to know how to live in these kinds of times where we're overrun with licentiousness, where we battle it. It, it is, uh, as, as the authors wrote of the book, Every Man's Battle, it's a battle because everywhere you turn, there are opportunities to be tempted. Because of sexual immorality, because of the temptation to that, notice his standard. This is this is very important. Each man should have his own wife. That is radical when Paul writes this. And each woman her own husband. He's, he's clearly using language here that talks about a one man, one woman relationship bound together in a monogamous marriage for their existence on this earth. There is no door open here. You can't slide a sheet of notebook paper into this position in terms of the possibility of, of two men, two women, uh, polyamory, all these fascinating uh, euphemisms that are, that are being thrown at us today. Uh, now in, in, uh, in California, a bill before the legislature for, for adult-child relationships. Here's the standard, biblical standard. And it's been there since Genesis 2. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, a man, and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And it's, it's, it's an aspect of the one flesh relationship that Paul has in view here. To become one flesh is to be joined together in mind, emotions, affections, and in body. That's why the biblical standard of chastity outside of marriage, that you come to marriage, you consummate the marriage, the physical 
aspect of it, but you're joined together in a one flesh relationship. And Paul has that in mind, uh, knowing the Hebrew Old Testament that taught that standard, even though it was, it was ignored as concubines were brought into the, to the matter when, when, a, when the wife of a man could not conceive so as to carry on his, his heritage, concubines would be brought. It was, it, was all, it was all a mess. And by the time you get to Solomon, you've got a huge mess. Because <clears throat> now marriage is used as uh, a way to get treaties with other, other countries. The standard has always been, brothers and sisters, one man, one woman, joined together in a one flesh relationship for all of life. And we're going to look at the passages next week where Jesus taught on this, and he says this is, this is a command from the Lord. We're going to look at those passages. But get it, get it in focus here. Paul is responding to the Corinthian. Think about two ditches. One ditch of just wanton licentiousness, that uh, anything goes. We told you before there were, there were, there were these... Uh, pagan teachers who said, look, it's just a body. The body's evil. What does it matter what you do with your body? The important thing is, is, your, is your spirit. Stay out of that ditch of, of licentious immorality. There's also another ditch here, though, and that is this, this reaction, overreaction to that, and that's a, a, a celibate mentality to the extent that we're going to look at in this passage that, that people were thinking, well, gee, now that I'm a Christian... Even, even if my spouse is a Christian, we need to divorce because Christians have no business being married. Paul says no. Marriage is not just to alleviate temptation, but it is a context in which temptation is alleviated. So I want to introduce the second point that marriage involves physical obligations binding on both husband and wife. We're just going to introduce it, and then, Lord willing, we will, we will come back and deal with this next week. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. Within the context of marriage, there's this ascetic teaching that's going on that though you are married, now that you are a Christian, you need to be, you need to be functionally celibate. You need to put uh, the, the sexual relationships of marriage behind you. You need to move and live on a higher plane. And Paul says that is just not true. If, if one of the purposes of marriage is not only to the procreation of the human race, to, for believers to model uh, the love of Christ for his church, the love of the church for Christ, uh, not only uh, that, but to, but to give a context in which you can fight sexual temptation and help one another to overcome that or to avoid that. Paul says to go into the matter of thinking that, that I am I'm a, I'm a Christian. I belong to the Lord now. Paul's basically saying, okay, you're not your own. Previous passage, you belong to the Lord. But guess what? If you're married, you belong to your spouse. Your body belongs to your spouse not to be uh, taken advantage of, not to be misused, abused, treated harshly, but in a practice of self-denial to think more highly of others than you do of yourself. For the wife, verse 4, does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Now that blows some people away today. But this is God's design. Likewise, notice this again is mind blowing because because this is not the typical thought of the first century. He, typical thought of the first century would have begun and ended. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Now, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. He began the passage that the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. You, you would not expect that kind of language in that culture. Christianity revolutionized human relationships. Verse 5, do not deprive one another, 
except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. This idea of devoting yourself to prayer is not, is not your, your typical as you would have a life of prayer, praying daily. This is a, this is a season of prayer, a, a devoted season to prayer, much like devoted to fasting. And, in, and so in fasting, you would, you would avoid uh, those things that you would normally uh, enjoy and engage in to focus more exclusively and intentionally on Jesus and on a, on a need that is there an issue that is there. So he says, when you mutually agree as husband and wife in the Lord, that we need to devote ourselves to this, then he says, you may, you may suspend temporarily that principle that obtains uh, throughout the relationship. And then he says in verse 5, so you're not just understand. But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So you see the issues here? Self-denial, self-control. Marriage is, an, is a context in which uh, a man and a woman uh, can, can get on the top of self-control over their physical passions. We are not, husbands are not, wives are not, to punish their spouses by withholding from them. That's. That is sinning against them. In fact, that is laying the trap for them to, to fall into temptation. And we'll go into this more next week, but I wanted to kind of give you the, the flavor of this, that he is, he is here. Now, why? What's, what's the issue here? It's going to be clear. It's about the gospel. If you could remain, he's going to talk about this. If you could remain celibate, then you would be unfettered. And we'll look at this. We'll talk about what the, the life of the apostles next week. But if you cannot, if you, if you haven't uh, received the gift of celibacy where you can remain single, then in marriage is the place for you to, to fight one of the most uh, deadly battles human beings face. Because you see, the, the, the impulse <clears throat> to sexual engagement is given by God for the procreation of the human race. And so we're going to look at this more next week, but it's about, it's about the gospel. So you don't defame the gospel by, by engaging in illicit relationships and bring, bring the gospel into reproach where you have said, I belong to Jesus, and I want to invite you to follow Jesus. And yet if you, if you cannot maintain self-control, you, you ruin your witness there. So keep thinking that. It's about the gospel. Your marriage is about the gospel. Your current relationship, your status is about the gospel. You say, well, I'm not a Christian. Well, you need to become a Christian to give your life purpose, eternal purpose. But you don't get to escape God's standards of morality by claiming, well, I'm not a Christian. Seventh commandment is for everybody. Marriage is a wonderful arrangement under God where we practice it God's way, where you can fight some of the greatest battles that we face while on this journey from this world to the world which is to come. So do you see your marriage as a setting for the gospel? Do you pray, dear God, make the gospel prominent and preeminent in my life? Do you see your current relationship, your current status? Maybe you're not married. Maybe you're single. Do you see that as, as your opportunity to fulfill God's call on your life for the gospel? We'll talk about it more next week. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge that you are good, your ways are good, uh, you, you are wise, and we lack wisdom. Please give us wisdom on this, Lord. We we have uh, picked up too much stuff in the culture around us that really is not healthy and does not instruct us in terms of how you would have us to live as men and women, followers of Jesus Christ, and how our marriages, our lives, can show forth the glory of him who called us out of darkness into marvelous light. I pray for the marriages here, Lord, that we will be uh, to one another in your presence, all you would have us to be. I pray for those who are not married, that 
that you would help them to find uh, contentment and your providence and embrace it and not let the devil lie to them that somehow uh, there's something deficient or defective or substandard, but that creatures made in the image of God, saved by grace through faith, are whole beings. So help us to study through this and to learn that we might guard our own hearts, be instructed thereby, share with others who have lost their way in this wicked and perverse generation. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.